Hello everyone, welcome back to Flying Through the Helicopter Flying Handbook. This video is going to be about chapter 3, which is a pretty short chapter. It's all about flight controls. So what are the different flight controls we have in our helicopter? We have our collective control. And what does it do? It changes the pitch of the rotor blades collectively or all together, and hence the name. So we have a collective, and that is used in order to change our pitch. So if I go to my helicopter here, you can see I'm looking at the main rotor. Now, a couple of things. Here I have this item on the bottom, this is called a stationary swash plate. And this thing above it is called a rotating swash plate. So what does that do? Basically, I have these two plates. One of them is stationary, it's connected to my flight controls, and the other one rotates. So it transfers the tilting, lowering, raising, etc., of this plate to the upper plate, which allows me to change the pitch of my rotor blades. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is right now I have my collective control all the way down and I'm going to raise it. So as I raise it, you'll notice that both of these plates drop and what happens is the pitch goes up. So here's low pitch and now I'm going to high pitch on my rotor blades. So I drop this plate. We have these pitch links that are connected between the rotating swash plate and the actual rotors themselves. And that's how that works. By the way, if you're wondering, this is a dampener for the lead lag hinges. We'll have more about that in a future video, but that's what those are. So we have a hinge, a feathering hinge, it's called, that allows us to change the pitch of the rotor blade. We have a lead lag hinge, or sometimes called a drag hinge that allows these to move in the plane of rotation and there are reasons why that would want to happen. We'll talk more about that later as well. And then of course we have a flapping hinge. So you can see here that each of these blades has a hinge that allows the, the blade to flap up and down. And we already talked about why that is when we talked about dissymmetry of lift and such in the previous chapter. Okay, so that's your collective control. Now, if I go inside the helicopter, I can see my collective control here to my left. And once again, I can raise it and lower it. Now, connected to that control, we have the throttle. So it works just like a motorcycle if I twist this direction, that's more throttle. And I'll twist it back down to idle. Now we did briefly mention before that many helicopters have one or two items that will help you maintain the RPMs that you require on the rotors. And one of those things is called a correlator. A correlator is a mechanical coupling and it allows you to increase the throttle. So if I just raise this up, it will automatically increase my throttle, which is kind of cool. And if I decrease it, it'll automatically drop the throttle. So, you know, if I'm pulling up the collective, I'm increasing the pitch on those rotors. So I probably need more power. And if I drop it, then I can decrease the throttle. And that will help me try to maintain roughly the right RPMs. And different helicopters have different qualities of correlators. 
Uh, the Enstrom, for example, has a really good correlator. It also has a pretty tight RPM band, but it is essentially set it and forget it. Um, the Schweitzer, depending on what you're doing, you might have to make minor adjustments to stay in the right place. Now, some helicopters have a governor. A governor is typically an electronic device that monitors the RPMs and it will automatically set the throttle. The governor is an option in the Schweitzer, although I've never seen one with that option installed. And it is mandated on the Robinsons. So originally the Robinsons came out with just a correlator and no governor. Uh, they're nearly impossible to fly already. And they said, hey, you know, this is making it even harder to fly these little helicopters that are so weird that they have their own special regulation SFAR 73. And so the FAA said, hey, you're going to have to make people install a governor onto that Robinson helicopter so that you can kind of fly it. So they have both. So what's the upside of a governor? Uh, the upside is you can be really lazy. You just roll it up, in the case of the Robinson, past 80% RPMs, and it will automatically go to 104% RPMs, which you might say, why is it 104 instead of 100? Well, they change the RPMs over time, and that's why. The downside, the biggest downside is, number one, if you're flying a helicopter that has a governor, and that is you know, what you get used to, and that governor fails, as everything can, then you might be in a bad situation. You might be hating life and thinking, wow, this is really, really hard. Whereas if you're used to flying a helicopter that doesn't have a governor installed, you're like, well, okay, this is just, um, just normal. Um, other issues with a governor, if you have a governor and the governor is demanding full throttle and you keep pulling collective you don't know that you're running out of power now you can also override a governor so in the case of the robinson uh, if you clamp your fingers down on that throttle you can cause it to do what you want so you can override it and in many helicopters you can turn it off as well what other kinds of controls do we have? We have our cyclic controls. So why is it called a cyclic? It's called a cyclic because as the rotor spins in different parts of the cycle, it will move. It's essentially tilting the disc, but how does it do that? It tilts the disc by changing the pitch of the rotor during its rotation. Now there's the classic cyclic control that you're going to find in nearly every helicopter and then of course the Robinson has to be different. So in the Robinson you have this little teeter bar. You know it has the upside of making it easier to get in and out of the helicopter instead of climbing around the cyclic which is normally between your legs you just get in. Uh, downsides if you're doing instruction in the Robinsons you know you're down here with the cyclic and your instructor has this cyclic floating in the air and it's very small control movements to fly most helicopters and that's certainly true with the Robinsons so having your arm kind of floating out in space doesn't make it easy to fly them. So, you know, once again, the SFAR 73 that applies to the Robinsons requires that you take a special check ride and you have a good amount of experience in each model Robinson in order to be able to instruct in them. And this is part of the reason for that is that it is a little bit harder. Also, they have this little chart and they talk about what do you do you know, if your RPMs are low and your manifold pressure is low, well, up the throttle. What do you do if your RPMs is low and your 
manifold pressure is high, well, you're pulling too much collective. What if the RPMs are high and the manifold pressure is low? Well, you're not pulling enough collective. So go ahead and pull more. And if they're both high, then you can reduce the throttle. And it'll we'll juice both of those. Okay, so back to the helicopter. So inside, push, you know, my traditional cyclic. By the way, uh, if you're curious what I'm using for controls, I'm actually using a Puma helicopter control setup. I'm not using the absolute latest, which I think is the fifth generation controls. I have the fourth generation controls, which is what was available at the time that I bought them. If we go back outside, we can see what this is going to do. So here I am pushing the cyclic to the left. You'll notice that it is tilting that stationary swash plate left, pushing it to the right, forward, and backwards. By the way, if anyone ever asks what is this part here called, at the bottom of these rods, this is called the bell crank mixer. And all it does is it mixes together the flight control inputs, if you will, in order to move that swash plate. So that's the cyclic. So what other kinds of controls do we have? Well, there's not much left. The only additional control we have is the anti-torque pedal. Now these work similar to rudder pedals in an airplane. If I want to yaw to the left or counterclockwise, I push the left pedal. If I want to yaw to the right, I push the right pedal. So those are my anti-torque pedals. Now in a good helicopter, these will be adjustable. So if you're flying something like an Anstrom or a Schweitzer, you will have adjustable pedals. If you're flying an R22, sorry. If you're flying an R44, yes, those are adjustable. It can make a big difference. I remember when I first started instructing in the helicopter, I used to just leave the pedals where they were so that I didn't have to constantly change them because the other instructor was a little bit shorter than me and what I found is if I fly in that helicopter for even just a few hours and I have the pedals pushed too close to me uh, you end up being kind of uncomfortable and almost a little bit sore at the end of the day we have anti-torque pedals now your book does mention something I, I guess it's worth noting if you have a dual rotor helicopter of some sort you don't necessarily have a tail rotor you're going to have something else where you're going to modify the pitch on one or both of your rotors in order to cause a yawing moment but you know most of the helicopters you're going to fly especially training helicopters probably have a traditional tail rotor or something very similar so that's what we're going to talk about right here Okay, so let's go back to our helicopter. So here we can see our tail rotor and we have these pitch change links. So if I push on the left pedal, remember the left pedal is my power pedal. So what is that going to do? It's going to increase the pitch of this tail rotor. So it's going to demand more power out of my helicopter to go to the tail rotor and this is going to cause the tail to be blown this way since we're looking at it backwards that would be to the right so the tail goes to the right and then the nose of the helicopter yaws to the left if i go back to neutral you can see it gets to be pretty much flat and then if i push the right pedal it will go the other direction. So now it's going to try to push my tail this way, which is toward the left, and then the nose goes toward the right. Now notice that there's a lot more pitch when I go left. And remember we said that helicopters have left turning tendencies as opposed to 
airplanes, which tend to have right turning tendencies. So this is going to require more thrust toward the left to overcome those tendencies in the helicopter. Something else to keep in mind, you know, on a windy day, and we'll talk more about this later as well, you, you have only so much pedal and every helicopter is a little bit different in terms of how much pedal you can give it in a particular direction. So in a very windy day, you can get into a situation where you can make a pedal turn in a hover one direction, but not the other. Okay, so that is chapter three, which is all about flight controls.